You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. Andy Tanner here. So uh, excited to be here. First, I've got my friend. I'm going to introduce uh, him him first. <laughs> no, we have Noah Davidson. You know, Corey gets he gets his feelings hurt. Yeah. I don't, you know, yeah. So I well, I know th- you notice Noah's the right hand man. He's oh. on your right hand. Well, it I depends see, so. on how they're looking. We can flip the screen. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> we Good go thing Andy's one of those your other left. guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ambide- I'm, I, you know, there's ambidextrous people and there's amphibious people. Yes. <laughs> Rick, I played for Rick Majerus, and he used to talk about right handed players, left handed players, but he didn't know the word ambidextrous. So on the board, he'd write amphibious. He goes, this guy's one of these amphibious guys. <laughs> yeah. And the center, Larry, he'd sit next to me. He goes, he can shoot on the water or he can shoot on the land. <laughs> <laughs> right-hand man, left-hand man, water, land, well, fire, I'm, earth. Land. Here's a little trivia. I'm right-handed, but I swing lefty. So every oh, you're I played lefty? baseball growing up. I was batted golf? lefty. I golf lefty. Really? But I'm now, right-handed. I, so. I golf. I, well, I'm terrible either way. I can't say I golf. <laughs> I attempt to golf. Uh, I drive right, but I putt left. Oh, really? Yeah, I putt oh. cross-handed. Oh, interesting. I have one hand that can do everything and one hand that just occupies space. Yeah. So, you I know. have a right hand <laughs> and a left hand, not a right hand and a wrong hand. <laughs> yeah. So, Noah, a little background on you. Um, Noah, is he runs our mentor club, and you've done this for a number of years, over 10 years now. Yeah. The mentor club is where people can follow along weekly with what you do. We have a portfolio. I'll come in and give a little color commentary once in a while. And it's really fun because if people want to see it in action, it's a lot like an immersion experience. You know, if you want to learn Japanese, you could take a class on Japanese. You can move to Japan and then you get fluent in a year, right? You, yeah. By immersion. First day is tough though. Well, it's like learning a new language. So a little bit about your background, we should introduce you. Most people know you, but there's always new listeners. So. Well, I'm just a guy um, who started, I got kind of caught the bug for investing and trading back in the late 90s. And so I'm really dating myself. That's there. the worst time to yeah. get in because you couldn't miss and you thought you were smart. Oh, I thought I was a genius. Yeah. I thought I'm I was a killing genius. this. Look at and then I, then I figured out I had to learn some things. And so I dedicated myself to education, uh, learned a lot of great stuff from a lot of great people, yeah. really invested a lot of time and effort into learning. And I was able to parlay that into where now I've taught, I don't even know, tens of thousands of people how to trade and invest over the years. And I have a lot of fun doing it. And one of the greatest lessons I've learned from hanging out with great mentors like Andy is just how to keep it simple. Yeah. Um, none of this stuff's rocket science. Anybody can learn it. It's, you know, even I can learn it, you know, and I was a good solid B student in school because I took easy classes. So, you know, <laughs> you know, I got through my whole high school career and I only got one B. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Now, you could say, (laughs) what does that mean, right? What does that mean? Great to have you, Noah. You know, he set a high bar to make it simple because they were going to talk about the Fed. (laughs) And I can almost guarantee we're going to go down a hole. So if you, a rabbit hole. So if you guys really, you know, just bear with us as we go down the the roller coaster. Corey, uh, you know, it was fun. When when we started the Castle Academy, I started teaching... Uh, in 2007, and then we became the Cashflow Academy about three years later. And, uh, you know, I just said, who are the best guys I know, and do they want to join this mission to teach? And Noah's one, and Corey was one. Corey, you're a Series 4 option principal. Most people don't know what that is. Uh, I just don't know of any academy that has someone with your credentials teaching. So I'm really grateful to yeah. have you here. Yeah, so I've been doing this a few decades as well. I went sort of the traditional route. So in the U.S., you get a Series 7 license. That's a general security representative. And then worked my way up the ladder for a number of years and became the Series 4 option principal, which is the head of option trading at the firm. I was worked for a New York-based firm for many years doing that and just loved, i just passionate about the markets. I love talking about this stuff. I love teaching others. I've taught tens of thousands of people taught classes down live at the the CBOE, the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. Wasn't that done, fun? Yeah, just, that so things, fun. just things like that that are, you just see when, when it clicks for someone and you know that they now understand it and that they're going to be able to utilize that skill for the rest of their life and the way that that improves their life, uh, just the, the life-changing educational opportunities. Great mentors like Andy 
uh, that I've known for many, many years. We've known each other for 20 some odd years yeah. and we team teach, but we also trade and invest yeah. and do things together. So uh, it's just been fun. It's a passion that I have and love it. What I think is impressed about both of you is uh, confidence. I remember Corey said, you know, if you ask me to do this, no, this, no, this, no. But when it comes to trading, I really do feel confident in what I know, yeah. how to manage risk. So that's fun. So and for those of you, if you're new to the program, by reference, whatever, I'm Andy. And I'm a student. I, I've always I hated to call myself an expert because I like the idea that I can learn more. I'd rather have the mindset of learning than of, oh, I know all this. I'm going to bestow my great knowledge on you. I do have some things to share, but uh, I've been, uh, oh, shoot, I've been in this game you know, kind of like you guys have for a long, long time. I was not a good invest, uh, investor when I started. Um, I was a guy who was a really good teacher. And I could teach basketball and I could teach, you know, whatever I wanted. But I wanted to know about money. And I thought if I'm going to teach it, then I guess I'm going to have to learn it. And so I, was a, I wasn't beating Warren Buffett in an investing contest, you know, when I started. That's not why I started to become a teacher. But I, could out, I think I could out-teach a lot of those guys and make it simple, which we're totally not going to do today. Uh, really fun show to, to start off. Uh, let's start off with some new fun things. Uh, one of the things podcasts are just a great way to get information. And you, know, when you find some information that you like, you you know, want to look at education. So we've got a new URL we're going to announce. It's called your investing And you go there and you can get, you know, we have resources. Our, our job is to help you grow your money and grab more assets and accumulate assets, uh, cash flow. And it really doesn't matter whether you're just starting out. You've you know, read a book like Rich Dad, Poor Dad and said, well, I want an asset for the first time. Or maybe you're savvy. But we have great stuff for you. So investing, uh, your investing uh, class.com, your investing class.com. New, new URL, so check it out. And I'll mention that a couple times in the show. So uh, other than that, uh, how are we doing? No, how I'm are you? Good. I'm excited to be here. You look, you look really happy. You know what? It's Halloween. It is Halloween. <laughs> I'm a little it sugared is. up already. That's my. So we're <laughs> we're good to go. <laughs> sugared up already. You know, it's kind of funny because we're not drinkers and smokers, and marijuana takers, but we'll take the sugar. And that's what, that's how we live our lives. It's a refined white powder. What can I say? <laughs> You're killing me. You doing well? Yeah, doing well. Okay. Excited to be here. We're gonna have some fun. Today we're gonna today we get to armchair quarterback. It's an easy job to criticize. That's right? that's the best place to be. It's not the critic who counts, <laughs> it's the guy in the arena. So we're gonna we're gonna go after uh the Fed today. We're gonna talk about Fed blunders. And it's not a job I'd want. So yeah. you know, no disrespect to Chairman Powell and his mm-hmm. predecessors, but it's a tough job. You know, but someone has to Somebody's do it. Somebody's got to do it. Or it's, we could just ban the Fed. Yeah, Nobody needs to do it. Abolish the Fed. There's yeah. a big crowd there. Oh, yeah. You know, want to do that. We just got a whole bunch of fan boys and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that right now. <laughs> <laughs> abolish. Oh, yeah, I'm in. Yeah, I'm yeah. in. Let's go. You know, libertarian, extreme libertarians. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think it's been really interesting. I think the Fed's in a hard place. And I think that we're going to talk about some of the blunders that they're in right now. And... Uh, it's in, well, first of all, why is this important? Why should we be? I mean, if someone hears the Fed, and I, uh, I'm out. You know, fast forward this triple speed. Let's <laughs> yeah. keep me away. Don't listen while driving. I I think it's absolutely fascinating once you learn behind. It's kind of like I, I was telling Greg Arthur this from the Rich Dad Stockcast. I told him about my son, who doesn't. Uh, he wouldn't eat bread like David wouldn't eat bread forever. And one day we were at an Italian restaurant and. Uh, you know, he tried a breadstick, and it was like cocaine. He's like, can I have another one? Of those? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we had sugar and bread, refined flours. Yep. And now he likes bread. And I think it's kind of like that, that when people who are new to investing, they hear about things like Fed, and they hear about things like reverse repo and all this crap. And they're like, oh, my head hurts. That's so boring. But I'll tell you, it's one of those things that once you start to learn about it, you're like, this is actually really interesting. Have you ever seen a documentary yeah. where you thought, oh, like, for me, it was uh, the flat earthers behind the curve. Oh, I yeah. saw that come up on my Netflix feed like 25 times, and I'm like, I'm not watching. I'm not going to spend one second of my time 
watching people that think the earth is flat. Like, there's no way. But I saw those five-star reviews. I thought, how could this possibly have five stars? Two minutes on, I'm like, this is freaking fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> and then Andy guys. gave me a recommendation, and I watched it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fascinating topic, it was. right? Yeah. yeah, crazy. So we're going to talk about the Fed a little bit, but why should people care? Why shouldn't I just turn this podcast off right now and say, eh, I don't care? Well, it's fascinating, but it's also something that impacts everyone's life because we all deal with interest rates in some capacity, right? You can be an investor and there's rates associated with that. You can be taking out a mortgage or need a loan and there's rates associated with that. And the Fed benchmark is the benchmark rate that all rates are based upon. So what the Fed is doing what they see in the economy and where rates are going. Rates go in trends, right? They'll, mm -hmm. They don't raise one and then cut and then raise. And then when they start to raise, it goes on a trend or they'll halt for a while and that's a trend. And then it will, they'll start cutting rates and that will be a trend. But that trend of where rates are going and where the benchmark rate is, where current interest rates are, those are critical things that consumers and investors need to understand. Well, and I mean, even the average consumer, if you look at the dual mandate, it's not just the rates, you know, it's the money supply and the inflation, uh, the inflationary pressures that result from it. And so that's something everybody feels. You know, when you go to the grocery store and you, and you check out and you're like, I just spent $200 on, on what? And you check the number of items in your bag and you're like, that doesn't quite, you know, resemble what I'm used, used to. to and so people feel that, absolutely. And so yeah. it affects, and when you understand uh, the levers that they're pulling and how it can affect the, the, the short term and the longer term outcomes, then we can position ourselves to, to do something about it. It's empowering. Uh, I think so. I, I think back to what Corey said, it, you know, when I grew up young, they say, well, the Fed sets the rate. And I just thought it was a law, like they'd pass a law and say, here's what everyone's rate has to be. But really, it's about competition. So I would start with people that don't understand the Fed very well is you think of it this, it's about risk. Theoretically, and we've talked about this on this show before, theoretically, you know, Alan Greenspan, he says, we can pay any debt that we have because we can always print money to do that, right? We, yep. You know, we can pay back. So the idea is if I, if I loan money to the Fed by putting it in a savings account with them, I'm basically, you know. Risk-free. Giving money. I'm, it's going to be risk-free. So what that means is if you're a mortgage guy, you can say, hmm, I can loan this money to this guy who might default, or I could put my money at the Fed for five and a quarter. Well, if I put my money at the Fed for five and a quarter, and that guy's riskier in the Fed, I got to charge more for this house guy, the credit card guy, the yeah. student loan guy, whatever it is, all of those things that are risky have to be higher I mean, they don't no, have to be, but well, they're going to be. They're going to be because you have to be compensated for the risks you're taking. Right. Nobody, if risk-free is 5%, then taking a little bit of risk should be 6 and a little bit more risk should be 7 and a lot of risk should be 10 and 12 and that's the way that we think about these benchmarks is what is the risk-free rate of return at the Fed and then everything is competition beyond that. So, and, and that's how lenders look at it. They say, okay, well, we know we can get 5% here, but I think this loan is good. It fits in this category and we can get 10 there. That's 5% better. Okay, let's make those loans that fit in this category. But if we're only getting 7% for those, nah, we'll just park it at the Fed for five. And that's the sort of competition that goes on at financial institutions. And consumers, of course, your credit score, all those things, that's you in competition to the Fed. The Fed's at five. I got to prove that I'm worthy of a great rate. Now, I'm not going to, they're going to charge me more than five because they'll get that risk free and I'm still some risk yeah. even if my credit score is 800, right? Yeah. So they might charge me six and seven, but if my credit score is really good and I've proven worthy, get close. You know, I'll get closer to the Fed number. So the Fed. You know, they're pulling one lever down, the other one's going up, and they're always doing it. So let's look at one example. You know, they do one thing, and it, it affects something, so they invent another lever almost. And since 2007 and eight, you know, right around there, they've just invented more levers because yeah. they'll pull one down. This go, Well, let's pull another one. In. So here's one, that, blender number one. Um, 
if your bank, let's talk about banks, you know, a deposit at a bank is a liability. It's, it's, I have to pay, even if it's small, I got to pay interest to these savers. And let's say I, I got a lot of money coming in and I don't have a lot of loans going out. So I have a, I have more money in savings than I have out in loans. That's can screw up my balance sheet. If not make it unprofitable, less profitable. So what do they do? They, they buy bonds. They say, well, let's take these savings and buy bonds and pay them less than what we get from the, from the bonds, you know, from the U S government. So some of these banks will stack up, you know, a sizable portfolio of bonds. And these bonds were for years at what, Noah, like, you know, Half, Half one, percent, you know, whatever they were, close, yeah. close to zero. But internationally, some bonds went negative, which makes no sense. So they were yielding negative. Japan's which, still negative, which means that essentially people were buying bonds that they would have to then pay interest on. So imagine you giving someone a loan and then you saying, you know what, I'm going to give you some money for you taking that money from me. You know, <laughs> so I'm going to pay you interest. And they went negative yeah. for a while. Billions of dollars worth in negative yielding bonds. It was bizarre. And that's what central banks can do is they can throw the market out of whack. So let's say this concept. Let's say that Noah has pays $1,000. He loans the government $1,000. So that's called par value. So he gives them 1000 bucks, and they say, we're going to give you 1%. You say, okay, you take my 1%. Now, if you hold that to maturity... You'll get your 1% a year. You'll get it if you hold it to maturity. Then they raise rates to five. And Corey goes out and he can buy one for five. Which bond is worth more? A $1,000 bond that pays 5% or a $1,000 bond that pays 1%? So I come to the market and I say, I want to buy a bond. What if you really, 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 really want to sell yours? Well, Andy, ten bucks is ten bucks. <laughs> so I think if you give me a thousand bucks, you'll get ten bucks. You know, um, but if you can go get you fifty can try, bucks, you can try that. Yeah. You can try. It. And so you know, he, you're gonna have to sell yours at a discount. Yeah. You're gonna. It's a fire sale, basically. You know, if I can go out and get, and if the Fed, you know, says, "Oh, uh, I'll give you three now," so he, I buy his for five. I'm gonna have to pay more because you, you, that's better than yeah. three. I can brag about mine yielding five. Yeah. He can't brag about his yielding one, and he has to offer his bond at a discounted price because nobody will buy his bond yielding one when they can get bonds in the open market for five right now. So his bond has lost value. Now, if he holds it to maturity, he'll get the full amount, but he has to hold it for years to, to get, get that, to that back. Right. If he wants to sell it early, he has to sell it at a discount because it's lost value. It'll be less than $1,000. Exactly. He will lose money on that bond because I'm not going to pay a full thousand. Well, shoot, I can go pay a full thousand with the get Fed 5%. myself, get five, and go get one brand new for yep. five. So that's why when interest rates go up, the value of the existing bonds go down. So that's the first thing I'm going to kind of take a pot shot at the Fed for is, you're thinking, okay, inflation, inflation, inflation. We got to curb inflation. Let's raise interest rates. But if you raise interest rate, what does that do to the bond portfolios of all of these banks? Well, and, yeah. and the bonds were so low for so long that they have significant amount, amount of money of, tied up. Those exactly. portfolios are pretty big. So you have a, a, a like Silicon Valley Bank. They got a ton of these. They got a ton of these bonds. They drop interest rates, and all of a sudden, people say. Hmm. I want my money back. It's like, it's a wonderful life, you know, building a loan, James yeah. Stewart. Well, your money's not here. It's in his house over here. <laughs> you know, he, 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 and, and, and it's not here. It's in his house over here. You, know. you got to, you got to understand these things. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's really bad. I do a better Seinfeld. Never mind. So we'll, we'll do What's that the another. deal with these bonds? Yeah. <laughs> What's the deal? Kramer, there's bonds. Yeah, how do you do the bonds? They're raising rates. Okay, so enough of that crap. So what happened was is they kind of had to run on their bank. They said, look, we want our money out. Yeah. And they're like, well, your money's not here. It's in these bonds. Yeah. They go, we'll sell the bonds. We don't really want to sell them because they're not worth anything anymore. You know, the rates are high. Our yeah. bonds We're going to take a huge they loss. suck. And sure enough, they had no choice. You know, you got to liquidate. So on Friday, they go bankrupt. And so what does the Fed do? 
Well, that didn't work. Let's get another lever. Yeah. Let's get another lever. Tell you what, we'll now guarantee everything at par value, and we'll give you lo- or we'll give you loans against this to to handle this stuff. So now, if they run on the bank, keep keep your bond. Don't sell it at a discount. Keep your bond. We'll loan you at par value, which is kind of weird. Yeah. It's called mark to market type stuff. You know, yeah. mark to market. They say we'll loan you at par value until you get through. Another lever for the Fed to pull. Another thing. Yeah, and that, they, that was after some of these companies Sunday. had gone under, right? Yeah, and Sunday. so you can argue that the worst thing that ever happened to Silicon Valley Bank and some of these was how many deposits they got in. And you yeah. think about a bank that should be the best thing for you is to have a lot of inflow of, of capital, a lot of deposits. You can make more loans. You can generate more profit. Yes, it actually you can make was. More loans. Well, it actually was the worst thing that happened to them because as those people, it wasn't money that was sticky and was going to stay long term. It was money that flooded in on the back of 2020 COVID crisis. Yep. All this money got out, dispersed free and money. found its way into so the bank. Again, that was the Fed, right? That yep. was the government that was sending out Fed. checks. So that money found its way into banks. And when it filtered back out, those banks had bought bonds against all that money. And now all that money's leaving. They don't have the money to backstop those bonds. They don't have the money to pay back those depositors their money unless they sell the bonds at a huge loss. So literally everything that the Fed was doing was working bank. against these yeah. banks. And it, they're going to say, well, you guys made your own investments. You guys, yeah, yeah. but you're still pulling levers, Fed. Yeah, for you're sure. Still pulling levers. And you have to figure out what levers they're going to pull and make sure... Like even the risk-free rate of return, well, it's not risk-free because they had to sell those bonds before maturity and take those literal losses, right? They had capital losses on all of those bonds they were selling. It was a disaster. I don't like the term risk-free rate of return because I think it presupposes that a dollar's worth something. I mean, there's still... Okay, we'll pay you back. You loan us a thousand, we'll pay you back a thousand dollars. But will the value of that thousand dollars be the same as when I borrowed it? No, it'll be worth less. I I have to make a little pause when I say that. Yeah. Worth less. Less than what it can't was. Can't say it that worthless. That no, it's too too extreme. But but yeah, it's kind of weird. So I think the the the, the Fed's not thinking about how many companies had these bonds, so they invent another lever. Okay, yeah. another blunder. What what you got? What do you think? Well, you got to talk about price stability, right? So yeah. they, for the longest time, said, "Oh, inflation. It's just transitory. transitory. It's it well, seems like it's a big deal right now." They didn't start raising rates until inflation was over seven yeah. percent. Like some of it's just common sense, right? You're at seven plus percent inflation before you start raising rates. You thought that when it was at six that we were fine. I mean, that's three times more than what your mandate is. And you're like, oh, I think it's good. I think we're, I think we're fine. Yeah. I think she'll hold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so start raising rates at seven. I mean, they well, were and, way behind. And technically, that. don't they have to bring that rate up above the rate of inflation in order to bring the inflation rate, rate down? down? That is historically, yeah. I've checked with a couple of PhD, you know, egghead type guys. Yeah. And they say historically... That's kind of been the case in a, in a lot of inflationary, you know, you get 10% inflation, you got to get a 10% rate. Yeah. And we haven't got there yet, you know, but they're working on it. Well, there's, they're still going up. So we'll see how long yeah. that lasts. I think it'll level off before then. But, but to your point, the, the grocery store stuff, it was really weird because I don't do much of the shopping. You know, my, my sons and my wife are pretty kind. But when I go, I, I'm looking at like eggs are like, what? Let's go. Yeah. No, now you have chickens. Yeah. You know, I asked Corey. So Corey raises <laughs> chi- how many chickens? Yeah, I'm like, we have, hundreds, we got nine chickens. Nine chickens. They lay about an egg a day. Yeah. Somewhere right around, around there. there. So I go, Corey, <laughs> I walked into this. I go, hey, Corey, you know, is it expensive to feed these? You know, and he goes, Andy, it's, it's chicken feed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not expensive. Yeah. Not bad at all. But Which has have gone fun. up in price. I assure well, you. Yeah. <laughs> it I was have, forty dollars a bag. I have now a, it's fifty dollars. Yeah, I, I barely joined the pet community. I have a koi pond, so I have some fish. Yeah, you've got you 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 any animal that comes to buy, you kind of keep it as a pet. No, nope. well, we had ducks for a while for the eggs, yeah. and and they didn't make it. 
<laughs> Didn't you have a varmint or something come in? And something get your, got them. They disappeared. Got your they disappeared overnight because they Poor didn't Poor little get Jonah up. lost his yeah. dog. Just yeah. a pile so, of feathers. <laughs> now I just but, have the kind of pets that's frowned upon to eat. But the the uh, I, I like that Jonah was a was was like a little snobby with his eggs. He was oh, like, yeah. I I yeah. only eat duck eggs. I only, they're pretty Not good. Chicken. They're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they're a big. Baker bigger. secret. That's a little awesome. bigger. So. Inflation at the grocery store is not going to, it's like when they say we're going to fix inflation, we're not, we're not going to go back down. These prices I think are here to stay. I don't think, I mean, they would have much to, harder to cut prices, right? They might level off, but it's exactly. very rare for pl- prices to go yeah. down. They're saying, they get, they're going to say, we're going to get back to 2% inflation is what they want. Yeah. And that's, that's not going to change. That's a big, that's a big blunder because the whole, here, here's the, the conundrum of this is you have COVID and you say, well, the people who are poor need help. So let's print a ton of money and let's send out a bunch of checks so everyone can buy their stuff. When they send out all the checks and everyone can buy their stuff, supply and demand. We got all this demand and demand goes up when people have money, when they have the ability. It's kind of like real estate, zero down, no doc, stated income loan, anyone can qualify. Yep. Uh, student loans, anyone can qualify. So tuition goes up, how prices go up. Okay, put money in everybody's pocket, go to the grocery store. It's always going to do that. So in, in an effort to, you know, on the fiscal side, you know, $1.7 trillion rescue package, you throw out an economy to help the poor, and now their grocery bill is killing them forever. Their rents are higher, right? The rents are higher. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Well, we've talked about this before, that ultimately that money seems to find its way to the producers, not the consumers, right? Yes, it does. And so if you send out all those checks, it's a temporary stimulus, but it's going to find its way to corporations. There's going to be so much demand for products that they're going to raise prices, which ultimately hurts the people that don't have assets that, that are not producers because now they have to come up with new capital to now buy those goods and services yeah. at higher prices and it makes just, the rich richer. Yeah. It's just a, and, and the rich problem. usually have more investment debt instead of credit card debt. And that makes their debt worth less as well. Yeah. It's easier to pay it off. So, you know, real, real problems. Okay. Coming up on the fed, you know, before the show, we were talking about uh, some stuff. What do you see on the horizon? Um, some of the conundrums they're in right now. Well, I, th- I think they're still battling this inflation, which has ticked up a little bit recently. Right now, I think the inflation rate's at about 3.7, so it's well, still and, almost and twice. They kind of manipulated that number by, well, right. by manipulating the data set to get a faster reduction by just taking out this old data here. We don't need that. that, that that'll, <laughs> yeah, wait. Always... that'll slow us down. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's just pull that out, and then it'll, it'll show, it'll reflect a faster drop in inflation. So it's, it's an artificial number. Yeah, right. That um, people don't, it, it doesn't translate into what people are experiencing in real life. Yeah, and, but even the, even the manipulated number is too high according to the Fed's own yeah. policy. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're going to have a meeting this week. They're expected to hold on rates. So I thought they said they're going to raise them one. No, they're going to hold. So hold the, here. The, the probability oh. of a hold, and then there was this tiny probability that they would I lower. Thought it was, I thought it was a probability of... Uh, yeah, up and then they the switched from last fold. from last report to this report. Yeah. They, the question was, are they going to okay. raise? Now the question was, they're going to pause. Are they going to uh, lower? And here's your a, problem. Yeah. You pause, does inflation resume with all the money yeah. that's still I out mean, there? Well, they're it's, kind of worried about like kind of the trampoline effect where if they pause and start lowering too soon, that'll just send prices you know higher. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Boy, I'm glad I'm not the one pulling the levers. That sounds like yeah. an impossible trying to invent job. lovers. Yeah. yeah, and and I mean, ultimately, this is a mess of their own doing, right? They're trying to fix a prior mistake, and so I would compare it to a golfer. You know, I'll use a golfer analogy. If you're standing over the ball and you got to hit it over water, and you just plop one in the water, what are you going to do? You're going to go club up, right? You're going to say, "Well, I might sell this one over the green, but I'm going to get past that water." And so the Fed screwed up and they let inflation get out of control. So I think the Fed is going to say to hell with the economy. If that's yeah. what it takes, we have to we can't keep hitting it in the water. In other words, we've got to get inflation, which is what we just screwed up. We got to get past that. And so 
my thought is, is that they're willing to let people lose their job. They're willing to let some of those negative things happen, happen. slow the economy down because they do not want to be the ones that just let price stability. I mean, that's the bigger risk is that they let inflation get out of control. And so I think because they already know they screwed up, they've admitted their mistakes. I think they, they wait, really on. have they, to they battle this. It? Oh yeah, they said that, that they- Yeah, Powell, I must have, I must Powell have said that. he was wrong in that, so many in words. Saying, well, in saying transitory, trans they clearly, yeah. Yeah. clearly yeah. they- Because nobody knew what that word meant to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but they the admitted Fed, that they didn't know what it meant either, and they yeah. got it wrong. And the <laughs> Fed and the Fed has a funny way of speaking anyway. I mean, it's like, yeah, this is how I say it. We're going to print money, everybody. He's like, we're going to expand the uh, balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They, they have a way yes. of saying things. Not Ben Bernanke. He was just kind of helicopter Ben. He was, yeah. was sort of, hey, we're just going to start dropping some, some money, and we'll see how. I mean, they invented – all sorts of things. That was kind of the start of quantitative easing, right? Yeah. Uh, well, they, they, they started did. pulling, for example, when they first started having problems in 08, you had all these toxic assets that were so intertwined, yeah. um, you know, with, with all these other banks. You had all these CDOs that were toxic. And think about this for a minute. I, I've got the new version of 401 Chaos coming out, so I'll give a little preview to this. It should really make people angry. You have corporations, you have Wall Street. When corporations get in trouble because they promised all this money, like to pensions, and, and so let's say your pension liability is kind of like the U.S. off-balance sheet liability, like yeah. Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. You made all these promises you can't keep. Well, pensions are the same. We're going to pay you when you retire, right? Yeah. We're going to pay all you auto worker, you, you know, all, all you airline pods are going to pay you. So what does the government do? They go, they take a gavel, and they go, Chapter 11, you don't, those promises are gone. Mm -hmm. Now do a 401k instead, just restructure it. You know, you don't have to keep those promises. So one tap the gavel, but it's even better for Wall Street. When they get in trouble and they have toxic assets and they have these assets that are going to disintegrate in value and it's just going to, their balance sheet is the collateral for this guy to borrow. The, yeah. It's all intertwined, dominoes. You know what they do? They say, tell you what, we'll why don't you take it. that, yeah. you know, piece of crap that Great Dane just put on your doorstep and we'll buy it from you with fresh new cash. How about that? Yeah. And so instead of buying treasuries, why don't we buy everyone's crappy assets and give them fresh new cash instead? That'd be kind of nice, right? And that's exactly the policy they did in, in 2007-ish, 8-ish. Yeah. they never done that before. They also started paying interest rates on deposits at the Fed. So people, and I think they did that to keep out of the economy keep it at the fed oh great buy the bonds get the cash now take that cash and so put it on deposit of us operation twist is that the little yeah game that's kind of that type yeah. of yeah. stuff yeah. Yeah. so and there's they, i mean you look back and they they argue that that was a great thing because if you look at what they did and bought those assets they actually made the taxpayer a little bit of money yeah. but i would argue you literally bought those assets at the bottom and you barely made the taxpayer a little tiny bit of money. If you time the bottom, you're supposed to make a lot of yeah, money. Yeah, you know? it was bad. And that tells you how bad it was in terms of what they were buying. Yeah. That all they did was basically ride them back up to break even. Took The taxpayer took all the risk Absolutely. from these corporations and then made a little bit. And you're going to call it a well, success? My I don't, favorite was the that's way not they, they rebranded it from Toxic Asset Recovery Program to, to the Troubled Asset troubled Recovery asset. Yeah, Program. It's, oh, yeah. it's just crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like we say, they have ways of wording things. Well, you know, it is Halloween. I think they should hold a seance. <laughs> yeah. And they should channel the spirit of Paul Volcker. Oh. <laughs> then you have interest rate. Yeah, you want 18% interest rates? Yeah. <laughs> hey, we might be headed there. That would be above inflation rate. You know, if you get Volcker back well, there here. There you go. Volker was a big, tall guy like me, man. He'd walk, walk in the room, and man, you, you knew when Volcker was there. Yeah. So, um, the, the big thing is, is, you know, people listening is these guys sit and talk about the Fed a lot. You know, a lot of the episodes they do is about the Fed, 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 Fed. Why, like, let's talk about forward-thinking instrument. From what you were saying earlier, Corey, uh, sounds to me like you're thinking we're going to have a little stagnation in the market. Maybe 2024 is a stagnant year, maybe even a pullback year. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been on the Fed higher for longer camp here for the last while. I think, 
I think that's what they're committed to is that, you know, to use that golf analogy, they screwed up and now they got to hit the longer club. And that means that there's the lever pull is we got to get price stability under control. And what's the side effect of that? Well, they're raising rates to get inflation under control. That's going to slow down the economy, but it is, it is slow to move. I mean, you look at consumers, consumers refinanced all their debt that a lot of the consumers are not in a bad place immediately, right? And they had a lot of stimulus and they had a lot of excess cash. So this recession is gonna be slow to come. It already has been. Like people thought it would be here already and it, it hasn't, but I still think it's coming. I, I would okay. be in that camp. The, the problem is you got AI. AI is gonna make things more efficient. That, that could cause the, the market to boom a little bit. Where are you, Noah? 2024 let's just get the let's get look we can't even get through chris or through halloween without christmas decorations in costco so yeah, yeah. we just will start a 24 24 prediction stuff early you know it's it's hard for me not to get caught up in the in kind of the fear aspect yeah, of because we've been coming. through it well it, again and i have memories of the you know the dot-com mm -hmm. crash i've got memories of the 2008 too big to fail crash yeah. And it, you know, to me, it's just kind of like watching the dominoes just set up. And so I have, I have this fear that, you know, boom, once they start going, it's, they start yeah. falling. Yeah. Um, now AI is a game changer, but is that a game changer for whom? I don't think it helps the average employee slash consumer. I think it's going to create mass unemployment, yeah. which is a different, different problem. So I think that uh, there is, they, a lot of people talk about it. There's a great reset coming we, and that's you know those yeah. are loaded terms for people um but it's a restructuring of debt at the end of the day because not just it's not just the consumer debt out there i mean government debt levels are so high now that these interest rates are changing the way the amount of gdp it takes to service the the national debts and that's you know it's a u.s problem it's okay, a Europe problem back it's a, to yeah but let's go back to fed blunders now let's go to, we'll get back to this too but we're digressing a little bit fled fed blunders um you're going to raise rates. You're going to raise rates. You're going to raise rates. Okay. People are going to keep buying bonds and they're going to buy even more because look at how much money I can make. You're going to have, you're going to have money leave equities and you're going to have them go to debt. Hey, if I'm getting a dividend at 4% for a dividend, but I can get a 30 year guarantee for, you know, five, I'm going to sell that and go for the five. So here you have a whole bunch of money that would leave the stock market, go into treasuries, more treasuries sold. But, and, and here's the thing. <laughs> You got to pay the interest on that now. You used to pay none. Now you're paying five. Do that on your uh, mortgage. Add five percent to your mortgage and see how much you're going to pay for that house in interest yeah. now. What does your amortization look like? So, what are your thoughts on that, either of you? <clears throat> there's a there's a there's quite a bit of debt out there, and the numbers are, I think, really quite incomprehensible for the average person. I mean, it's it's hard I mean, to wrap your head around it. Yeah. So you just have to lop off some of the some of the digits there and just kind of put it to like a family budget type perspective and say, well, there's thirty three you know trillion dollars in debt. Well, let's just drop that down to like, well, there's thirty three thousand dollars in debt, and the GDP is they're they're pulling in eighteen thousand dollars a year, yeah. and you're kind of looking at that gap and that deficit, and then you start thinking about, well, that's gonna you know the debt service is gonna be this percentage of that. Yeah. Um, it's a budgetary constraint that they have to cut spending or increase GDP. And I don't know which is going to come first, push comes to shove. Um, but there's, that creates a solvency problem for governments. This is where I think there's an opportunity at some point. I don't know if I'm going to time the Great Reset right or not. It's going to be hard for any of us to time it. But I, I think you should do your best to prepare for defense and even offense. I, I yeah. think that there's going to be opportunistic opportunities in that transfer wealth that are really going to be hard to ignore i'm not really one to speculate but a guy like soros is going to be looking at this and i think even buffett maybe on the buying side maybe not the shorting side that's not his style but the buying side but but think about this we have so much detachment from the market in terms of prices and fundamentals yeah. huge detachment and now it's about the quick bucks so if i got ai and I'm a technical or a quant guy, and I've got some quant or technical formula that I'm going to try to make a ton of money on a little move like this. Well, if, 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 if we see a Fed policy that says, you know what? 
There's no money. There's no money made in stocks. Let's go somewhere else. The amount of money they'll yank from stocks could be profound, and then that creates problems and a little contagion. I mean, and and under the stress that we have now fiscally, I mean, and and you know, liquidity wise, my goodness, maybe we maybe we have a little catalyst for a for for something exciting. Yeah. Is that yeah? Am I, I mean, got my tinfoil hat on and Well, I think I think you're thinking of it the right way. There in sports they say defense wins championships, but you do have to play offense. I've never heard of a championship team scoring zero. Zero and right? winning. Yeah. So you have to you have to do both, right? You have to play good defense, but you have to play if you're not scoring any points, if you're not invested in something, you'll you will lose the game. Well, right? and so, sometimes defense can be your offense. For example, right now, precious metals are running they're running strong. Yeah. Well, why? Yeah. Because there's money. There's kind of a, the flight to quality where they're like, well, I want to hold that you know precious metal asset, and the price of gold and silver is running pretty hot. The price of commodities, oil is running a little bit hotter right now. And so Pete, there is money moving. And again, traditionally, the the flight to quality. What I learned was you know you go to bonds. If you're if you're nervous about stock values, they're you know bringing them down. Yeah. Um, which might not be the worst move in the world because there is there is some yield there. And so as people are searching for yield, mm -hmm. um, defense and offense are almost inextricable yeah. at a certain point in time because where do you go? Yeah. Well, okay, that's going to hold value. That's probably going to appreciate. Yeah. That's yeah. going to be something we use anyway. That's going to be something that's got higher risk profile. Maybe we avoid that. Exactly. And and that's the thing about investing is. There's always an opportunity, even within the defensive assets. You can, they can be offensive. You know, they can score. The bigger your points the move, and, the bigger yeah. the chance the world. The bigger the opportunity. I think people, the mistake they make is they say, "Well, Corey thinks and Noah thinks that we might have some stagnation, maybe even some pullback." Well, we're like, "Yeah, awesome. That'd be great." I mean, I would. I, I my favorite crash of the three we mentioned. You know, dot com, 2008 subprime meltdown and COVID. COVID was the fastest and the quickest. It was the most glorious. I mean, I really, I would not yeah. mind getting back below COVID levels again in the market. You imagine what we'd buy? Yeah. I mean, like right now in the Mentor Club, we're hedged risk-free. That thing can fall. We don't care. We'll, we'll cash out that assurance and we'll buy in low again. Yeah. And, and the thing people need to realize about these crashes is usually the next crash doesn't go back to where the prior crash was because of inflationary pressures. It's, it's sort of like... You know, can Coke and Pepsi reduce prices? Maybe a little bit, but they never quite go back to where they were yeah. a few years back. You mean back, you can't right? buy like, a Coke for 50 cents anymore? It, exactly. 15. That 15? ship has sailed. Well, and, I know. I'm, all, I'm only so old. Come on. Yeah. 15. <laughs> yeah. And that ship's I sailed. I remember and, when I was your age, we could get gas I for... I think you could get it for a nickel originally. 35 That's cents right. a gallon. <laughs> Dag well, so Okay, so inflation being a bit of a constant there, and, and you're in an environment where they're trying to bring inflation down... Um, it just kind of, I think it, it kind of rearranges the way you think about your playbook in general. Um, this is where trying to predict the future is really, really hard and I'm not that smart. And so what I do is I just watch charts and see what the smart or the more money is doing. Not yeah. necessarily even the smart money. The, yeah. What are the institutions doing? Oh, there, there's money going into gold. Well, how do I know that? I didn't rotation. Well, I see the chart. It's like, Oh, yeah. look, there it goes. It's going up. Yeah. And so that's where I think, um, identifying trends. And identifying them early on can set you up for this is for where this is yeah. where a little bit of swing trading, a little bit of position trading is big deal. I know you guys are working on a new course for uh, swing traders, like serious swing traders. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'm Mister Hold It and Get Your Dividend and Ride Through. It would really, really be difficult to resist the opportunity to maybe do a little bit of swing trading right here. Yeah, and, and trading versus investing, it's sort of to use the real estate analogy. It's do you want to buy the property and rent it out and hold long term? Or do you want to be a little bit more active in real estate and a house flipper or own it for a year or two and then look to you know flip that and make some money? And so trading is sort of that way where it's a little bit more active. It can be bigger reward, but you need to be on top of your game in terms of the risk management. And education. -wise. And education wise to, to know how to do it. So the Fed uh, is raising these rates. They're going to increase the fiscal problem by doing this because now we got a lot more interest to pay on the debt. Yeah. It's just every time they pull one lever, another one goes up and they got to invent a new lever. And I don't envy their job. It's easy for us to sit and criticize it. But, you know, they did make the policies and they have to kind of live in this uh, world that they've created, I suppose. So. Yeah.
Well, this has been an awesome discussion. Um, neutral to bearish, maybe in the future, great opportunity to pick up stuff on the cheap. You know, people say, oh, he's announcing the market was done. That's bad news. No, he's saying that oh, we're yeah. going to have a sale. And and long term, I'm always bullish. Yeah. People just don't own enough yeah. stock. They, they You look at average household and who's invested in stock, they just don't own enough. Yeah. And and they never ten, really... Ten-year horizon is always bullish. Yeah. They, ne they, they never seem to get confident on the stock market. You talk to people and they feel like it's a risky game. They feel like it's if manipulated they, they, or whatever, and, the and they is, don't understand it. But the reason is they're obsessed with price instead of business ownership. Exactly. You know, Buffett wrote his 2021 letter was so good. Oh, yeah. He's like, look, we're business owners, not stock pickers. Yep. We, we look at the prospects of the business long term, not the short term price fluctuations. So I think if you have a 10 here horizon, yeah, you're fine. Yeah. But if we have a big move, it's hard not to get excited about that. Get excited about it. Well, that. and I think, I think it's important to know how to protect the asset. Probably the worst thing people can do is just be inactive. Like inaction will, will be the big problem for yeah. you. you. I'd rather see P I'd rather see people doing something proactively and even making a mistake because they, you know, you don't always get it right. Then just sit on it and not play defense at all. And not, you know, think about, you know, you don't have to take all your money. You can take some of your money and put it into something that you, you know, like a, a tried and true asset, like precious metals. Yeah. Um, you can do yeah. something where you can say, okay, I can get some protection on my, on my, on my stocks that I hold. The, the biggest protection you're going to have is learning. Education. Yeah. The best your, education. Your, your biggest asset in the next year is going to be how smart you are. That always separates the people that make it from the people that get killed is who is smarter. Yep. So that's why I'm here with you guys is to get smarter. Hey, great, great show. Go to investing, or excuse me, go to yourinvestingclass.com. We've got some fun stuff for people there. And it's free stuff. So go check it out if you want more cash flow, if you want to learn more about assets, you want to learn about our four pillars that we use to invest with. Uh, go to yourinvestingclass.com and check that out. Uh, great discussion with you guys. Really fun. We get rambling. We go all day. So yeah. <laughs> it's it's really important to know how the Fed works as best you can and know how this stuff. So I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.